All right. Afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Erin McKiernan. I am a professor at the National Autonomous University of Mexico in Mexico City. Uh, today representing the Skullcom Lab as a collaborator and uh, we are super excited to present results from this uh, project. This, these are brand new. Uh, so uh, before I get started today, I just want to mention that this presentation is openly licensed as well. So feel free to take pictures, tweet, uh, whatever you want to do with that information. And I'll post the slides after the talk up on Figshare, uh, Zenodo, uh, so that everybody has access. All right, so let's talk promotion and tenure. So and I give a shout out to my dad. So my dad does these awesome cartoons for our Y Open Research uh, project. We also have some cards, so come and find me if you want some of those. Uh, so I think, um, you know, promotion and tenure is kind of this fundamental tenet of, of, ac of many academic systems throughout the world. Uh, it's something that personally, uh, my collaborators and I are thinking a lot about lately. So we're in the first few years of our uh, professorships. And um, I'm not sure where Juan and Meredith are in that process, but I'm about to submit my first paperwork uh, to go eventually towards tenure, hopefully. Uh, so we've been thinking about, woo, yes, thank you. <laughs> All right. So we've been thinking a lot lately about um, what goes into these promotion and tenure evaluations and what is it exactly that universities are looking at? How are they evaluating us as faculty members? Um, in particular, kind of what are universities valuing uh, and what are they rewarding? These might not necessarily be the same thing. So it might be that universities say they value one thing, but when we actually look at how they're evaluating faculty, they're rewarding something different. So there's some interesting uh, issues there. And then, you know, what counts toward uh, promotion and tenure? Um, are we only looking at traditional outputs? Are we seeing more of these kind of newer forms of scholarly communication getting into the evaluation systems? Or uh, how, does that, how does that look? So. One thing I think is important to recognize is that university uh, missions, their mission statements often posted on their website, heavily tout the importance of uh, community and public engagement, public good, giving back to the community. Uh, so these are messages that we see repeated a lot at the, at the institutional level. Um, but the question is, you know, kind of what are they doing with that, with that mission? Is it getting translated into evaluations? If we think about some of the public aspects of, of faculty work, that could take several different forms. Uh, so one could be different types of knowledge exchange. So in uh, different community forums or uh, different outreach events, we have this exchange between the faculty members and different uh, aspects of the community, different subpopulations within the community. Um, if you are a medical professional, you could then have a knowledge exchange also with a patient community. Uh, open access is kind of a fundamental part uh, that we were looking at here in the public dimensions of faculty work. So if a university is kind of touting this idea of public good, of giving back, of reaching out to these communities, uh, then presumably one of the really important things there is does this community, does this public have access to the research that we're producing uh, as faculty members. Uh, open source, or this could also say open data, open science, I kind of ran out of room here. But any aspect, of, any way in which we're sharing the different products that we produce as researchers and as teachers, this could also say open educational resources as well. Uh, blogging. Uh, so something that I think is important to recognize is that, you know, open access, we're talking about access to a scientific article, but there's also the issue of making information more accessible. See, are we talking about these things with language that the public uh, can understand, and how are we uh, communicating that, that information to the public? Citizen science, are we getting groups in, uh, in the public involved in our research projects, and, and how are we doing that? Uh, and then collaboration, again, you know, with patient groups, with all kinds of different groups in the community, we as researchers, we as teachers can collaborate. So these are all different ways that uh, faculty might be engaging in public uh, aspects of their, of their work. And the question is, then, how do these get evaluated? So researchers are often citing uh, concerns about how they get evaluated, concerns about the promotion and tenure process as a number one reason that they don't share their work. So if we, if we apply surveys to faculty at universities, they say, yeah, we like the idea of open access, we like the idea of open science, but it involves a time investment, it involves energy investment, and how am I getting rewarded for this? Where does it actually count when I go up for promotion 
and tenure. So there seems to be a conflict there between what the university is touting as a mission and what researchers are saying is their primary concern in terms of sharing their work. So some of the questions that we had here, we realized that we were missing a lot of information on what was actually going on in the, in the review uh, promotion and tenure process. So we, we decided we really needed to know what was in these documents. What do the documents say? What do the documents um, give as guidelines in terms of awarding points to different faculty activities, and specifically activities that have to do with the public dimensions of, of faculty work? And specifically, are universities uh, actually rewarding public engagement and outreach and sharing of research? And if they are rewarding these activities, how, how are they doing that? So. I uh, just want to mention quickly that all the data for this project is openly available on Harvard Dataverse, so you guys can go in there, play with the data, take a look around. Uh, the documents themselves have some copyright restrictions, so we weren't able to share all of those, but we did share all our, um, our spreadsheets and all that stuff uh, that you can go in and, and look at the actual analysis. So we started out uh, with some words and concepts of interest, so some obvious ones here, public. Uh, community, how often are these coming up in documents, how are they being uh, talked about, what are kind of the words that we see surrounding uh, mentions of public or community, and then specific references to public engagement and community engagement. Uh, so document collection was fun. <laughs> um, despite the fact that most universities have rules about uh, these documents uh, existing, it wasn't always easy. There wasn't a standard place on a web page where we could go and always find these things. We couldn't automatically scrape them. So a lot of this involved personal emails, uh, tracking faculty down, trying to find documents. We got a lot of responses that said, well, I'm not really sure if my university has a document like this or if my department has a document like this. Uh, so there was, some, there was some, uh, you know, some effort involved there, but we did finally get 864 uh, review, promotion, and tenure documents from 129 universities in total and 381 academic units. Uh, and th these are all from institutions within the US and Canada at this point. We divided these universities into R-type, M-type, and back-type. So whether it's PhD research-focused, master's-focused, or bachelor-level uh, focused. And it also has to do with the level of research intensity at each of those institutions. We divided academic units into disciplines very loosely, uh, life sciences, physical sciences, mathematics, social sciences, humanities, and finally, interdisciplinary. So uh, let's talk kind of simple percentages. So, 87% of the institutions do mention uh, community in their, in their RPT docs, 75% mention public, and 64% are mentioning these terms, these concepts of public engagement or community engagement. So we found these, these terms and these concepts to be pervasive throughout the institutional and academic unit documents. But then there was an issue of, well, okay, what's the context in which they are, those words are being, are being used? So here's the mentions in the RPT documents by institution type, so by R type in blue, M type in orange, and uh, back type in, in green. So you can see the mentions for public here, uh, more common in the R and M type institutions and the back type uh, community also uh, more common. And then the concept of public and community engagement, more common in the, in the masters, the M-type institutions, than the R-type institutions. So we are seeing uh, a prevalence of these terms and some institutional differences in terms of their, of their frequency in the RPT documents. Mentions by institution subtypes, so if we look within the R-type institutions, we see, for example, the term public comes up a lot more often in R1 and R2, which have a higher uh, research intensity than, say, the R3 or, or uh, R, R Canada, the Canada R-type institutions there, uh, which tend to go more with the R2 uh, US institutions. With community, again, seeing more frequency there in the R1, and then that frequency goes down as we go to the R2, R3, and R Canada uh, levels. And then the public and, and community engagement, again, a little bit higher with the R1, R2, and then, and then decreasing a little bit there. So seeing uh, some trend with a higher number of mentions of these concepts in our type institutions with a higher intensity of, of research. By discipline, uh, public community and this concept of public and community engagement more common overall in the, in the life sciences than the other disciplines that we, we looked at here, like physical sciences, mathematics, or uh, humanities and social sciences. 
So if we look at the context, so that's just counting frequency, but now we want to know how these words are actually being used. What context are they, are they being used in? So we looked at the frequency of words uh, within 15 words to these, to these terms or concepts of interest. So for example, this is a word cloud. For the frequency of words um, in around uh, the word public. So as you can see here, the most frequent word near public was service. So Typically, when we're seeing the word public in these documents, it's referring to public service, uh, which ends up being kind of the least valued of the, of the trifecta for review, pro promotion, and tenure processes. So we have this trifecta of research, teaching, service. Service often gets relegated to kind of third place. And so when we're seeing these mentions of public, they're usually occurring in this context of, of a service type category that's valued least. Uh, community, we're seeing community, this word is occurring uh, very close to the word university, again, very close to the word service. And so what we're seeing here is the word community in these contexts often refers to the academic community, not the public, or not communities outside the university. So it's referring to faculty or some type of uh, research community there within uh, academia, rather than, than an outreach uh, type of activity. Okay, so we wanted to extend beyond just this, you know, kind of frequency counts or context for the words public and community and engagement, and then uh, look at what other things are occurring in these documents. We saw huge emphasis on traditional outputs of um, scholarly work. So we wanted to see, okay, so how often are traditional outputs getting mentioned, things like books, articles, conference proceedings, those typical academic uh, products that we see. How are these, talk, uh, these documents talking about things like metrics, citation counts, impact factor? Uh, how is impact actually discussed or, or measured? And then finally, the concept of open access. So again, if we, we want to see how these universities are talking about reaching out to the public, how much of the information is actually publicly uh, accessible, and are they putting an emphasis on that? Uh, so here are the mentions, again, by institution type, R type, M type, back type. So Impact metrics, uh, much more commonly mentioned in the R-type institutions. These are the research-heavy institutions rather than the M-type and the back-type. Traditional outputs mentioned in over 90% of, of these documents. So traditional outputs all over the place and emphasized heavily in these RPT documents. So despite the fact that we're seeing these advances in scholarly communication and the new ways of communicating information, uh, th these evaluation processes are still very focused on, on traditional outputs. And then open access, uh, hardly mentioned at all. So mentioned in R-type, M-type, not at all in back-type. And in, in a moment, we'll see that the context of these mentions is important too. So um, they're not always positive mentions. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. All right. So institu by institution subtype, so again, impact and metrics, uh, we're seeing a tendency for that to, those those terms to occur more often in these research heavy uh, institutions and then traditional outputs all over the place again. So this is something that's getting emphasized throughout these documents. Open access, uh, some mentions in R1, some mentions in R2, zero mentions in R3 and uh, R Canada institutions. Uh, and again, these are not necessarily positive mentions. By discipline, uh, it was interesting that at the academic unit, uh, we only saw mentions of open access in social sciences and humanities documents and no mentions in the life sciences, physical sciences, et cetera. Uh, impact a little bit more common in the life sciences, but it wasn't, it wasn't significant. Uh, and again, traditional outputs being emphasized all over the place. So I want to just go into a little bit more detail on open access. This was something that I think uh, was a little bit depressing for us. Uh, so we work a lot in the scholarly communication space. We work in the advocacy space. We see a lot of things changing, a lot of new policies, institutional policies, national level policies on open access. Um, and so we were expecting that a lot of this movement would hopefully have penetrated into these evaluation documents. And that, unfortunately, was not the case. So, only 5% of the institutions that we looked at mentioned open access at all in any context. Uh, the majority of those mentions were the either neutral or uh, negative. There were none that were explicitly supportive of open access or encouraging their faculty to publish openly. Uh, the majority of those negative mentions were questioning the quality of open access journals and specifically equating open access with predatory 
publishing practices. So, and, and this was, uh, you know, so not, not only not encouraging the faculty, but actively discouraging them to, to publish in open access. So this was something that was particularly upsetting for us to see. Um, impact, so we looked a little bit more closely at how these documents were talking about impact. And the most common re uh, word we saw next to impact was research. Unfortunately, how these institutions are actually measuring impact was often left very open to interpretation. Sometimes it did include unfortunate mentions of impact factor that was present in the documents. A, a lot of the times it was just left open such as high impact, significant impact, publications of you know, quality and impact. So it didn't say how this was actually getting measured. Uh, and it, I think in many cases this is intentional. It's leaving it up to the interpretation of the evaluation committee. Um, specifically looking at the public dimensions of impact, so this, this idea that we're going to talk about impact out in the community or out in the public beyond university walls, that was mentioned very, very rarely uh, in that explicit way. So in 9% of R type institutions and 11% of M type. So, this is not a concept that we're seeing uh, in a lot of these RPT documents. So, a lot of, a lot of conclusions to talk about, and I hope that then we can have uh, an open discussion, what, no pun intended, uh, about, this, about these results and what this means and how we go forward. So, overall, uh, some of the conclusions from this study, while we're seeing this relatively high frequency of the terms public and community, it doesn't always, and in, in rare cases, actually refer to outreach or reaching out to the public, reaching out beyond the academic walls and, and having some type of, of public good or community impact. It often refers to service activities that again are getting relegated to this last place in terms of priority in the evaluation process. And the community again often refers to an academic or a faculty community rather than uh, a public outside the university. Um, in these documents we're seeing neither explicit incentives nor very clear structures of support for any of these public dimensions of, of faculty work. Uh, you know, I mentioned, I saw, I mentioned how uh, few times we see the term open access. A lot of us here are working in open data, open science, open education. That was virtually absent from these, from these documents. Forget there even being, a, you know, a way of counting those, they're not even there. So, so that, again, was uh, very discouraging. And, and really shows this disconnect between what the institutions are saying is their public mission and how they're actually rewarding uh, faculty activity. So is there any good news? <laughs> this is all kind of depressing. Um, I think there is good news in the sense that this is something that we can still fix, right? So now that we have the information and we know what's in these documents or what isn't in these documents, we have a way to move forward. We have very clear areas where institutions can better match up what they're saying is their public mission with what they're rewarding in terms of faculty work. And so I think a big priority for institutions right now should be this change in incentives, this change in evaluation systems that really uh, goes towards promoting these public dimensions of faculty work and kind of moving towards a general scholarship of, uh, that has some type of, of public influence or public good. Um, yeah, so this is a, I get the honor of presenting with, this is a huge uh, team effort. So I want to point out Juan in the front here is the PI on this, uh, on this project. Uh, Meredith Niles, who couldn't be here today, she's our, our co-collaborator on this. Leslie Shemansky, Carol Munoz-Nieves, and, and Gustavo Fishman, all authors on this uh, particular paper. Um, and really all working towards collecting all these docs, analyzing the docs, figuring out kind of the framework under which we were going to look at these, at, at these different concepts of, of public work. Um, Funding, Open Society Foundations, a huge thanks to them and to Melissa Hageman in, in particular, who has been uh, extremely supportive of this work and continues to be supportive of us. Uh, thanks also to Spark, OpenCon, where are you? 
open cons all over here. Uh, so we had some great discussions at Spark meetings, at open con meetings that really were the, uh, one of the driving forces uh, behind this work and uh, a motivation. So thanks to that entire community for their inspiration. Uh, so I'm just going to leave you with Juan's message on our acknowledgments. Uh, <laughs> may your openness be rewarded. And I think this is uh, something that we have to discuss as a community. So we we're promoting these ideas of openness. But until they start getting rewarded at an institutional, at a department level, I don't think we're going to see these fundamental changes in faculty behavior that we really need to see to move this whole a kind of uh, open movement forward. Yeah, so with that, uh, thank you very much. And I will take any questions. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so there's two people here with mics. And uh, so we'll just go ahead and get started. And uh, I, uh, there was a quote, you didn't get to ask your question the last time, so I'll take you first. <laughs> so uh, thank you for the talk. The question that I've got is that there's, there's been a real movement in the master's level institutions and some of the research level institutions towards professional masters, or what I would call applied masters. And I'm wondering if that's behind some of the um, higher levels of interest in community engagement, despite the fact that they're kind of paltry overall. Um, I'm wondering if you have a sense of that um, as opposed to the more traditionally research-focused masters. I don't think we've really divided those up. Um, I'm not sure we had a, like, a, small, a, a big enough sample size to be able to really look at the professional masters versus the kind of more traditional masters. But it is an interesting question if there are these degree programs that are sort, sort of more focused in getting people into the workforce or uh, an applied stance, whether or not these concepts of community engagement come up more or come up in different contexts. That would be something interesting to look at, but I don't think we have the kind of end at this point to be able to really look at that carefully. Did you have a question? Yeah, there you go. Oh. I'm from Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, India. We are the largest uh, uh, technology uh, education school mm -hmm. who will uh, qualify for BAC, M, and R, all types. Mm -hmm. We have the largest uh, scientific uh, publications from India as an institution. So I would like to uh, uh, comment on the whole analysis of RPT because I also happen to be one of the RPT members in uh, my institution. See, if you look at the whole transition, the RPTs and the, are decided by Senate councils of various forms. And it's more an issue of Senate is the senior professors of the institute. Yeah. So they are at least 20 to 30 years behind today. I mean, I'm not generalizing, but that's the, and, and we have seen in, in, in the societal transformation that whenever there are new change, this age group takes the maximum time to change. <laughs> so. It, 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 it is not only the analysis of what is good, what is what the future is going to bring up on. There's a requirement of actually creating proper awareness yeah. amongst the senior people. And second, there has to be a deep thought in that what should be the transition process. I've become professor by uh, going by the traditional output measures. Now, my student has been trained in that way. That, that student becomes professor and does the same thing. Yeah. So there has to be a transitional mechanism to create future Senate Council members who would not be so ingrained like we are in terms of this traditional means. So open access, open data, open science, citizen science, whatever we call, has to also think about how to do, bring about these transitions in the big academic establishments that we yeah. have all across the world. No, absolutely. I would like your comments on that. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, these, these committees and, and who makes up these committees uh, is, is, I think, a fundamental part of how uh, they're putting weight on particular things and how decisions are getting made. Um, so yes, it could be in one sense that we just need to allow a little bit more time to elapse so that some of the younger faculty who are now working with these new forms of scholarly communication get on to positions on these committees as such that they can make real change happen. But I think what you mentioned is something important. So a lot, I think for, for a few years people thought, well, no, you know, we just need to wait <laughs> we just need to wait until the older generation dies off, we get the new ones in, we'll be fine. 
I don't think that's the case because what happens is the younger faculty are coming up in the system which puts such a huge emphasis on traditional uh, products, on impact factor, on all of these metrics that we know to be highly flawed. And, the, and, and selecting out people who are being more creative with their forms of scholarly communication, more diverse with their academic products, if we keep selecting those people out and, and promoting the people that are going with these traditional, the committees are never going to change. It doesn't matter if we have these new generations coming in. So I think education is fundamental in this. We have to have this, um, this type of training that, that tells people, look, we've got all these new ways of communicating, all these new ways of having impact in the public. How are we going to get this, uh, you know, at the evaluation level, but it's a hard problem. As long as you have people being successful with these traditional outputs in, in positions of power, they don't want to change things because the system has worked for them. Right? So how do we make change? I'm not sure I have a good answer for that, but just simply waiting isn't going to do it. So unfortunately, we're out of time. I think we could spend the whole day here talking about this. It's fascinating. And please join me in thanking Thank the you. great presentation. Thank you. Thank you.